The Russian invasion of Ukraine began with an attempted lightning assault by airborne and mechanised forces. But now, more than six months after the first Verdever trooper set foot at Hostomel Airport, it's very clear that all dreams of a rapid Russian victory are long dead and buried. Instead, the war has become a grinding attritional struggle, with the mass deployment of artillery and missile systems, and it's sometimes taking the Russian forces months in order to overcome small defended villages. This is no war of rapid movement and encirclement. Instead, it is a war of constant artillery bombardment and advances measured in the hundreds of metres, or a block, or an individual building. In that sort of fighting, the contest becomes less about the quality of any individual battle plan or the results of any individual day's fighting. It becomes about economics, about endurance, and about the will of a population to continue. And that is the contest that we have seen waged over the last six months, the efforts of the Western allies to hold up the Ukrainian economy, to resupply its armed forces, and to strike through sanctions and other measures at the ability of the Russian economy to sustain the war, while at the same time Russia actively deploying its resources as a mechanism to damage unity in the Western camp and hopefully bring Europe to the table. The hope essentially being that the threat of a cold winter will be enough to pinch off Ukraine's Western lifeline. Understanding how this titanic political and economic contest is playing out is critical to understanding the course the Ukraine war is likely to follow through the rest of this year into next year. But that doesn't mean you can find consensus in the media. On one hand, you have a paper that's come out of the Yale Chief Executive Leadership Institute arguing that Western sanctions have put Russia on the road to economic oblivion. On the other hand, you have Tucker Carlson running that headline and arguing that Russia is winning. My God, how will we decide who to believe? Fortunately, economics is one of those fields where there are at least some objective measures available, so we'll be looking at some of those today. What I'm going to be doing today is not so much looking at the battlefield after six months of fighting in Ukraine. We're going to summarise it quickly, but ultimately my area of focus is instead on attrition, economics, and the endurance of the nations involved. Because in the end, these factors are going to matter almost as much or even more than battlefield performance in determining how this conflict goes in the long run. So to that end, I'm going to give a six-month update on sanctions and the Russian economy. I'm going to look at how the allied economies in Europe and the United States and Ukraine are going. And then I'm going to put a big focus on the energy war, which is Russia's attempt to cause an energy crisis in Europe in order to put the squeeze on political will there. Then I'm going to look at the social and political dimension. Where does opinion in the various nations stand? What sort of appetite is there to carry on the struggle? Then finally, I'm going to put together some conclusions and a few predictions. And again, a caveat that I won't be focusing so much on weapon supply and battlefield performance today, because really it deserves its own video, so stay tuned for that one in the future. Now before we get into it, let me welcome back returning sponsor, Ground News. If you follow major international events, you'll know that accurate unbiased news is hard to find, and that it's ever more important to break out of the echo chambers of particular coverage. Ground News is a news comparison platform that helps you do just that. It's a combination of an app and a website that allows you to instantly compare coverage for particular topics across different news outlets from around the world. So I've previously looked at this story about the so-called LPR and DPR planning to block Google in their territories. At a glance, you can see that Ground News tracks 17 sources covering this particular topic. Ground News lets you instantly switch between headline coverage, see which organisations are emphasising what, and catch any hidden details. It lets you build a picture out of the entire media ecosystem, not just one story. And it can also let you identify broader patterns in coverage. Not every story is going to get the same amount of coverage everywhere on the political spectrum. And what Ground News allows you to do for every single one of the stories that they feature is to zoom in and identify potential blind spots in coverage. It's a great way to get an understanding of what's being reported on the other side of the political aisle. It also brings together a whole bunch of contextual information, whether that be the details of media ownership for particular companies, or ground news evaluation of their historical biases or factuality ratings. Things that can provide just a little more context to coverage. There are no silver bullets in the fight for accurate information, but I think we have to try. And ground news may be a tool that helps you see things just a little bit differently. If you're interested, there's a link to check out in the description, ground.news slash Perun. Now, as much as it's not the focus of this video, it's important to understand a little bit about how the fighting in Ukraine has gone over the last six months in order to give context to the wider economic and political struggle. After all, if Russia had taken Kyiv in two days and Ukraine had surrendered, well then none of these points would be particularly important. The key takeaway is that as of the start of September, the war in Ukraine is largely defined by positional fighting and artillery bombardments. Territorial changes were relatively quick and massive in the early stages of the Russian invasion. Now they have slowed to a crawl. 
You will, for example, continue to hear people who say that Russia is continuously advancing in the east, or words to that effect. Now, it's an imprecise science, but according to some of the maps out there, the general consensus is that about 0.08% of Ukraine fell to Russia in the month of August, which puts Russia on track to capture all of Ukraine sometime after 2100, with casualties north of 10 million. And the campaigning doesn't really look like either side is seeking some decisive engagement. Rather, each is seeking positional engagements and fighting an attritional war. Of course, relatively static boundaries doesn't mean the nature of the fighting has itself been static. It's been a constant race between Russia and Ukraine to introduce newly raised units, new systems, new tactics, in order to constantly adapt and get a one-up over the opponent. The Russian switch to grinding artillery-heavy tactics in the east gave them a degree of success, which Ukraine countered by the introduction of the HIMARS system, which Russia has in turn attempted to counter by doing things like seeking out Iranian drones, dispersing ammunition supplies, etc, etc. But what is clear despite that constant back and forth is that any argument that Russia is on the march towards some inevitable and relatively quick victory is wrong. One of the most common arguments that you will see on Telegram or Twitter or the comments on YouTube is to just look at the map, because apparently that shows that this war is running towards an inevitable Russian victory. Well, there's the map. The Institute for Study of War map isn't perfect. There are a lot of different ones out there, but they do not differ significantly in the boundaries they put forward. On the left are the battle lines as of March 27th, with the Russians at the gate of the Ukrainian capital. In the centre are the lines as of June 1st, and on the far right, fighting after another three months of Russian offensive action. Can you tell the difference between the two on the right? Three Days to Kyiv has become a month and a half through the house-to-house -house fighting in the village of Pisky. And I bring this up not to mitigate Russian military capabilities, Russian military accomplishments, or the intensity of the fighting that's been taken place. I bring it up in order to just basically say this. Russia may be advancing, and they may have advanced over the last several months, but at such a glacial pace that any dreams of this not becoming an attritional conflict decided by political willpower and economics is out the window. If this is the rate of advance the Russian army can manage, and it may speed up or it may be slowed down or reversed by the Ukrainians, it's hard to say at this point. But if it's going to take you 50 years to get to the Ukrainian capital, well then economics and attrition probably matter a lot more than how many artillery pieces you started the war with. In a long war, it's not enough to worry about how many vehicles you started the war with or how good your generals are. Economics matters, political and social will, the willingness of populations to carry on the struggle. Those matter. Diplomacy and allies matter a lot more, and military logistics, production and sustainment become increasingly important. In this sort of fighting, you proceed until your opponent is unable or unwilling to continue, or until you come to a peace agreement which is agreeable to both sides, given their willingness to continue the fighting. And so if you want to understand where the Ukraine war is six months on and where it is likely to go, I think you have to look at those factors as much as performance on the battlefield. And I think the best place to start is Russia and its ability to carry on a long war. Russia is a large and powerful nation with a significant arms production sector, but it's also carrying out the journey of becoming the most sanctioned nation on planet Earth targeted by a range of measures initiated by the United States, the European Union and their various allies around the world, intended to diminish the capacity of the Russian economy to carry on the fighting. So I thought it would be worth looking at how those sanctions have evolved over the last six months and the impact they are having. I think it's fair to say that the initial volley of sanctions was less intense than Ukraine wanted, but certainly extremely significant. In the opening weeks and months after the Russian invasion, Russia rapidly became the most sanctioned nation on planet Earth, and there are a few critical moments that need to be focused on and recalled. The biggest one, perhaps, was the exposure and freezing of Russia's forex reserves held overseas. Now, I'm going to be complimentary of some of the efforts of the Russian central bank later on in this video, but this was an undoubted colossal stuff-up and a sign that Vladimir Putin and his government miscalculated. Russia had spent years accumulating hundreds of billions in foreign exchange reserves to function as a war chest. They had sacrificed all of the potential investments and economic growth that could have come from investing those funds at home, and instead set them aside for a rainy day and held them in reserve. The problem was something like half of them were held overseas in banks in the United States or the EU, and these funds were effectively frozen soon after the outbreak of the invasion.
While estimates vary, it seems about half of Russia's enormous forex reserves were frozen by banks in the United States and in Europe. At a stroke, Russia's ability to cushion the economic damage that would follow was effectively halved. And a lot else seemed to be going wrong for Russia in these very early days. They failed to essentially break European unity, so you didn't see countries like Hungary coming out and blocking sanctions packages, and at the same time, the ruble was tanking incredibly quickly. But it wasn't all bad news for Russia. On one hand, Europe did seem nervous about imposing energy sanctions. And on the other hand, Russia's own market interventions to prop up their economy were gathering pace. In those early days, there was a lot of triumphal language coming out of the West that pointed to a crashing ruble and suggested the Russian economy was days or weeks away from effective collapse. The reason those projections are wrong, and the reason so many analysts in so many fields get projections wrong, is they assumed that Russia would do nothing in response. When you do something that threatens a business or a country, it's likely that they impose some sort of countervailing measures. And because of that, drawing a straight trend line is usually not a safe thing to do. Russia may have had hundreds of billions in foreign exchange reserves frozen and had its economy thrown into a tailspin. But no one working for the Russian central bank wants to end up falling out of a six-story window, and as a result, they got to work with a disciplined program of packages designed to stabilise the Russian economy. Capital controls were introduced on a grandiose scale. Foreign holders of Russian securities were unable to liquidate those holdings. There were a variety of measures designed to prop up the ruble in the early days, sweeping interventions across the Russian market. A rapid increase of interest rates up to as high as 20% to try and stabilise the currency and prevent capital flight were put into place. And then, having bought a little bit of time, the shock of energy markets as a result of the conflict further came to Russia's rescue. And I want to stress that some of these measures were just as dramatic and rapid as the sanctions that were being imposed. I've done a previous video on some of these measures. I'd encourage you to go watch it. But the Russian central bank was on point in terms of mitigating the initial damage to the Russian economy. It stabilised the fall of the ruble by holding foreign capital essentially to ransom and then allowed enough time for rising energy prices to stabilise Russian revenues and with it drive the ruble into the stratosphere. After all, you can cover up a lot of economic damage and weakness if you make most of your money selling hydrocarbons and the price of hydrocarbons goes to the moon. So where are we now, six months on, according to official Russian statistics? Officially, the Russian economy is holding together relatively well. They're projecting a GDP contraction of somewhere between 2 and 4.5% this year, with a more likely slant towards the upper end of the spectrum, with a plan for a further contraction next year. Hydrocarbon revenues are projected to be up year on year, with an asterisk because they've sort of stopped releasing some of the statistics we use to calculate those revenues. And officially, despite all of the sanctions and economic disruption, official unemployment in Russia is at a record low of 3.9%, which puts it lower than the European Union average, but above the US average. Inflation is officially at 12 to 13% for the full year in terms of projections, which is very high, don't get me wrong, but not completely out of step with the inflation rates we're seeing in other developed economies around the world. There are quotes of Russian government figures saying that foreign investment is down by about 20% for the year and that imports have nearly recovered from an initial slump. Those are the official figures. Of course, Russian statistics are increasingly suspect. They've stopped releasing certain statistics categories entirely since the invasion, while others are increasingly suspect for potential alteration, and I'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of where international actors and observers think the Russian economy is going, it varies. Bodies like the World Bank are generally projecting that the Russian economy will decline by somewhere between 6 and 8% this year, and it's already declined by close to 5% and will continue to slide next year. Non-oil revenues, that is government revenue that isn't derived from the sale of gas, oil and hydrocarbons, are down by about 15%, which is significant because it makes the government even more vulnerable and dependent on energy than it was before. Then there was the Yale report led by Jeff Sonnenfeld, and that's far more aggressive on the projected decline of the Russian economy. The difference in their mechanism was that they looked at paired data across Russia's trading partners and elsewhere in order to try and get behind official Russian statistics, and they conclude that the Russian economy is actually in even worse shape than the IMF and the World Bank are projecting. 
More broadly, the Russian economy's energy revenues are down from the March peak, although they peaked a little bit again in June when the European Union announced energy sanctions, and again, they're retreating from that high now. Imports from China are recovering to an extent, but total Russian imports, it seems, have nowhere near recovered despite Russian claims, and there are open questions around the inflationary potential of all of this stimulus spending that the Russian government is doing. Fewer goods are entering into the economy, and fewer goods are being manufactured and made available for sale at the same time as the government is ramping up stimulus payments, easy loans, increasing pensions, increasing minimum wages, and pumping an awful amount of money into the economy. That's a recipe to restart inflation in the near future, potentially. The point is there are a lot of external statistics which seem to suggest the Russian economy is in much worse shape than the official statistics suggest. And the failure to publish certain economic statistics is particularly worrying as an analyst, let me tell you why. Because when the Russian government starts withholding foreign trade data, export and import data, oil and gas monthly output data, capital inflow outflow data, financial statements for major companies, etc., it raises alarm bells for me. Why? Because nothing in the world is easier than lying on a single report or a single statement. What is incredibly difficult is having a lie which remains consistent with all other sources that a person could potentially check. Reality doesn't bend to your bullshit, so if someone scans and analyzes enough, usually they'll find a discrepancy if you're pulling it all out of your ass. If a government comes out and claims they have sold 500 billion barrels of oil in a particular month, it's very easy for them to claim that. But it's also likewise easy for people to go and check. So for example, if you go to all the potential buyers and get their data on how much oil they have purchased and it doesn't add up to 500 billion barrels, you're going to raise an eyebrow. What about shipping contracts? What about shipping insurance? What about the various resource exchanges? What about the status of various storages? How many physical barrels and storage media did they sell from the various manufacturers? All of those inputs and other measurements you can use to assess oil sales, not just the Russian government or another government say so, come into play here. If someone says their imports have recovered, okay, have they convinced all the other countries that export to them to rig their export data in order to cover up an import shortage. If Russia says its imports have recovered, well, we can go to the export data for China and India, the various European countries, and all the countries that export into Russia. We can look at those data sets and see, have Russian imports actually recovered? Or is there a massive magical gap where a lie might be? If I want to verify claims around inflation, well, I take the official disclosed statements around the basket of goods that makes up Russia's CPI, and you send operatives or you pay people to go into shops and check the prices on those goods in order to verify the CPI calculation. Is it accurate or has it been massaged one way or the other? The list goes on. If a government is saying its economy has a really good outlook, but the stock market is down 90%, well, then maybe the people buying those shares know something that the government isn't telling you. My point is it's really hard to lie and get away with it in something like economics or trade because there are always other sources that somebody could check if they're a competent analyst. So when a government stops releasing certain statistics, as the Russian government has done, it becomes increasingly difficult to trust the statistics they do release because one potential motivation, or at least a side effect of that decision, is it becomes harder and harder to verify the statistics that they do release. I can't prove, for example, that Rostat is playing with the numbers that they release. I've previously used Rostat numbers in some of my other videos, but it's becoming harder and harder to verify those figures for a reason, and so I'm going to treat them with greater and greater skepticism. And I apologize for that aside, but I thought it was worth explaining why it's worth treating Russian economic statistics with skepticism. It's not just anti-Russia bias. It's because they're actively giving signs or evidence that they want their statistics to be difficult or potentially difficult to verify, and as a result, they should probably be treated with some skepticism. I also think it's worth putting the Russian economic projections into perspective, even when you're talking about the low end. A 5% loss of GDP is pretty horrendous. By comparison, Ukraine is projected to lose about 35% of its GDP in this year, which is down from the 45% estimates that were being put out early. Ukraine had a pre-war GDP of about 200 billion US dollars equivalent, Russia had 1.7 trillion. If you apply those figures through, 5% and 35%, Russia's actually lost more in terms of GDP output than Ukraine. Now obviously there's a massive difference here between the loss in GDP and the loss in wealth. Ukraine is suffering immense damage to its infrastructure. It's taken hundreds of billions or potentially even trillions of dollars in actual damage. But in terms of GDP, it's a pretty wounding blow for Russia. 
Dmitry Tulin, who is a senior figure in the Russian government, estimated that Russian banks lost about $25 billion in damages in the first half of 2022 alone. That's not the Russian government, that's Russian banks. And it's from the impact of things like sanctions being cut off from SWIFT and so-called Italian strikes, which is where your counterparty follows every rule to the exact letter and as a result slows down your transactions. They do every check, every investigation, every verification. They phone you up, they query your data system, and they do everything they can to slow your transactions down, which is a great way to cause a bank to lose money in high-velocity markets like foreign exchange trading. It's also worth remembering that the damage to the Russian economy is not going to be spread evenly across the country. There are going to be pockets of immense suffering. Russia, for example, has, like many countries do, cities and towns that are focused on the manufacturing of a particular good or the service of a particular industry. So a town that might be focused on car manufacturing, for example. With car manufacturing down by something like 75% in Russia, those localities are going to suffer far more than the Russian average. So my point is not to say that Russia is suffering more than Ukraine. They're clearly not. Ukraine is the country that is being invaded. My point is that a percentage loss of GDP output often conceals some really painful realities for individuals, towns, or localities in a country, and I think in Russia's case, it's going to be no different. But let's look at some of the serious problems that Russia is facing and how it's tried to counter them. The first challenge for Russia is import substitution and trying to make up for the loss of Western imports, both in terms of informing consumer spending and allowing people to access goods, but also in terms of keeping their manufacturing running. A lot has been made of a Russian attempt to pivot towards China, to substitute the goods that they were previously bringing in from the West and bring them in from China instead. This is where the Russian claim that imports have largely recovered comes from. But the Chinese data doesn't really agree. Chinese exports to Russia in July were about half of what they were in February before the invasion broke out. Now, that's still a recovery from where they were in April, at which point they crashed to about a third of where they were in February, but still well below trend and representing a significant reduction. And that's an issue because if you're going to replace the hundred plus billion dollars worth of exports that the EU sent to the Russian Federation in 2021, and you're going to replace all of them with Chinese imports or the equivalent, then Chinese imports into Russia don't just need to recover to their pre-war levels. They need to spike well above those levels in order to substitute for those goods that were previously coming in. And that's before you account for the increased demands of running a wartime economy. Russia presumably wants to build more shells, more guns, more tanks, more aircraft, more armoured vehicles, and more replacements for all of the hardware that it's using. That requires imported components. It'll need to import components to get its car manufacturing running because it can no longer import finished foreign vehicles, etc. It doesn't just need to replace previous imports, it needs to well exceed them, and it's not. And one way the Sonnenfeld report highlights this is by looking at industrial production in the motor vehicle sector. By March, Russian production of motor vehicles was down by half. By April, it was down by 67%, and by May, the reduction had increased to 75% the Russian car manufacturing sector was down to 25% total output. Couple that with the fact that many Russian companies when surveyed suggest that they're still running down parts inventories, they're not building them back up, and you can see the situation is likely to get worse before it gets better. I imagine if Germany reported production falls like that, people would say that the German economy had been comprehensively destroyed. And yet there are those that will look at production figures like this and argue that Russia is doing just fine. If your country is incapable of putting together motor vehicles, you're going to struggle manufacturing more complex systems like anti-aircraft missile systems or tanks unless you can get import substitution rolling in a big way. And let's not underestimate the Russians here. There already are examples of sanction busting, goods moving through third countries, etc. The problem is these introduce both delays, limits on quantity, and also massive price premiums which drive up the cost of production at exactly the time that Russian consumers are least well positioned to absorb those increases. Manufacturing employs millions of people in Russia. In some towns or cities, it is the only major economic activity. So to see production collapse like this is a serious problem. The next problem has been capital flight and Russia's attempt to control it. Russian human capital losses have been significant. So if you look at the Yale report, for example, they quantify that as about 250,000 highly educated and 250,000 other workers 
who have left and departed Russia since the invasion began. About 20% of the ultra-wealthy in Russia, so 15,000 ultra-high net worth individuals, have crossed the border. They've left. They fled to Dubai or to neighbouring countries of Russia or to wherever they can get visas. And when highly skilled workers go overseas, that's a loss to the ability of the Russian war economy to sustain itself and to carry on. You need engineers, you need scientists, you need experts in order to bring additional manufacturing capacity online or to manage a war effort. But I would go further. I would highlight the fact that it's not just capital flight which reduces the stock of resources and capital available to a country. Devaluing resources and assets achieves the same thing. Now, I'm sure there are people online, Wall Street bets types, that'll tell me that a loss isn't real until you actually sell, but I would argue otherwise. If your house halves in value, you have half the capital available to you that you did before. And in Russia's case, well, for one thing, the stock market's lost about half of its value since the invasion in February. And I'll go further. I'll say that shares in Gazprom, so shares in the Russian energy sector, have gone down significantly, which means the market at least believes that this era of whirlwind, windfall energy revenues isn't going to last because they believe the long-term value of those stocks has trended downwards since February. Couple that with the fact that companies in Russia now find it incredibly difficult to borrow money abroad or to issue bonds, and the fact the Russian government doesn't even have a credit rating from most of the ratings agencies anymore, well, you can see my point. It's not just about capital flight, it's about capital destruction and the denial of access to more capital. And war is kind of expensive. But as I said before, governments adapt. They respond to threats. They don't just let the economy slide into oblivion without action. So Russia has rolled out a range of stimulus measures in order to hold the Russian government up. That 5% or 10% or 4%, whatever the figure on Russian GDP decline actually is, it's a product of intense efforts to avoid it being much, much worse. Now, a full list is available in the Sonnenfeld paper, but just as a glance, you've seen the Russian government offering subsidised loans and loan payments to companies, writing off debt, transferring payments to affected industries from the rainy day fund, subsidising mortgages, increasing pensions, increasing welfare payments, subsidising protection from bankruptcy and foreclosure, and directly intervening in the defence industry and a number of other sectors, among other things. Plus, they've broken out the Beijing playbook of extensive government-sponsored infrastructure spending. All of these measures are accomplishing their core goal. They're holding up demand, they're holding up the Russian economy, but they've also shifted the Russian government budget into deep deficit, and that's with windfall energy revenues. And to see the effect of this, you should look at the decrease in Russian forex reserves and also the drawdown of their rainy day fund. Zonenfeld estimated they started the war with a bit less than $650 billion in foreign exchange reserves, about $300 billion of that was frozen, and $75 billion of the remaining... 330, 340-esque, has been spent down since February. Now, none of this is particularly remarkable. It's very rare to find a country that will run a budget surplus while fighting a major war, although Russia doesn't admit this is a major war. The problem is, from a long war perspective, it points out that there are, in fact, financial limitations in place. Russia is spending down its foreign exchange reserves, and it is engaging in deficit spending at a government level at a time where it has no internationally recognised credit rating and it's going to find it very difficult to borrow money abroad. Now, that's not saying the Russian government is going to run out of money tomorrow. There's a near infinite list of things they could do to raise additional revenue, where they're confiscating it from ostensible criminals so they could charge oligarchs and take their assets, they could raise tax rates, they could nationalise industries at unfair prices and then liquidate them. There's a lot of things a government can do to raise revenue. The point is that they're definitely feeling the pinch it puts them on a little bit of a time limit before they have to do more and more uncomfortable things. I mean, the Russian government could sell its majority shareholding in Gazprom to Beijing, for example, in order to raise an ungodly amount of revenue. But it's really unlikely the Kremlin is going to leap at the possibility of selling away the future of the Russian economy. It's the availability of those sort of really hard, extreme choices that causes me to always come back to political willpower and the willingness of a country to carry on a struggle which leads to the question of what next for the Russian economy. And for my part, and this is now just me projecting and analysing based on what I've put in front of you, I think we're going to see a lot more of the same. Determined fiscal stimulus designed to hold up demand and keep the Russian economy from declining too quickly, at the same time as very determined sanctions busting and import substitution efforts to get everything they can possibly get from countries like China that were previously being brought in from the West.
I think they are setting the scene for an issue of stagflation, where the economy is not just not growing and inflation is high, but when the economy is actively shrinking and yet inflationary pressure is still very real because of the decrease in access to goods, so more money chasing fewer goods at the same time as the government pumping more and more money into the economy to try and hold it up during wartime conditions. Government revenues are probably the key to assessing how long the Russians can possibly keep this up. It's about energy revenues, really. The vast majority of government revenues in Russia don't come from taxation on individuals, they come from revenues from the hydrocarbon sector. So Russia's future, like the Soviet Union before it, really does rise or fall on the price and accessibility of Russian gas and oil. So we will look at the energy war in a moment, but first let's look at the other powers involved, because it's not just about Russia, it's about Ukraine, the US, the EU, etc. Because hey, if Tucker Carlson is right and the West is going to collapse tomorrow because of the energy war, well then, it doesn't matter that Russia can't keep this up forever, it just needs to hold up for the inevitable collapse of Western civilization. Please nobody take that quote out of context. The Ukrainian economy is obviously in immense pain. After all, the country has been invaded and bombarded. The current projections I was able to find for Ukrainian GDP are that it will contract by about 35% in 2022, and then projections for 2023 are basically everyone's guess. They range from something like a 12% rebound by those projectors who expect Ukraine to adapt to wartime conditions and continue to receive aid, to those who expect it to contract again further. And while it's often been a last minute thing, foreign aid has largely kept up with this burn rate. In August, for example, foreign creditors agreed to freeze $20 billion worth of Ukrainian debt for two years, basically giving Ukraine breathing room over the course of the war. And at the same time, there was a $4.5 billion worth of additional funding extended through the World Bank, thanks to the influence and the generosity of the United States. Another way of measuring burn rate is to look at the Ukrainian government's foreign exchange reserves. For the June-July period, Ukraine burned about $450 million US dollars worth of its $22.4 billion worth of remaining Forex reserves. As for the country's credit rating and thus its ability to borrow additional debt without the generosity of others, Ukraine's credit rating has actually improved slightly in recent months, although it still remains relatively dire. Now, of course, the Ukrainian economy is going to face at least two very large challenges. The first is going to be getting through winter, and the second, whenever this war ends, is going to be the question of reconstruction. But in the immediate term, right now, as long as support persists, it's hard to see a failure state for the Ukrainian economy. They have fewer tricks and reserves than the Russians do, but they also have this umbilical cord of foreign support. I think most Ukrainians appreciate how important that constant infusion of money, loans, weapons and other support is, and that probably explains one of the reasons why Russia has gone so heavy on the energy war in an attempt to break off European support. I also don't want to take away from the fact that when we talk about a 35% downturn and all of this capital damage in these very cold terms, what I'm actually saying is millions of people are being displaced. People's homes are being destroyed. People's work is being disrupted. People's education is being disrupted. Hospitals, schools, critical infrastructure is being lost and families are being broken up and their lives changed forever. These numbers represent very real human experiences. But at the cold strategic level, what I'm saying is there's no sign the Ukrainian economy is running on empty just yet. And then there's the United States. And here I'm going to respectfully disagree with Tucker Carlson and assert that no, the energy crisis is not about to end Western civilization and bring down the United States. The US has been through some significant rough patches in its recent economic history, not least because of COVID. US real GDP and real national income changes split in the early part of this year, so you could argue there was a technical recession. But US real GDP is projected to be positive for the rest of the year, and we've just seen some really good job indicators, as well as a very, very low unemployment rate by historical standards. Inflation is very much clearly the challenge of the day in the United States, and while the federal government may have mixed feelings about it, in particular the way inflation brings down the massive national debt by inflating the value away, for ordinary Americans the increase in prices is a significant challenge. Of course, in the American case, that probably owes a lot more to supply chain disruptions out of China and rapid expansion of the money supply during the COVID period, as opposed to any impact of the war in Ukraine. America remains the world's largest economy. Its fiscal capacity is massive, its industrial output is significant. So when we talk about the American economy being knocked out of the Ukrainian war, really what we're talking about is a political question, whether Americans are willing to continue supporting Ukraine, as opposed to whether the United States has the capacity to support Ukraine. It does, and there's no foreseeable scenario where it doesn't. 
So we will talk about politics later, but I wanted to touch on this issue. The energy war is not going to destroy the US. And in fact, if you're a US LNG exporter and you're selling into Europe, now is actually a great time to be alive. Because you are now a more significant supplier into Europe than Russia is. But it's Europe where the energy war is going to bite most significantly. It's Europe where the economic challenges are going to come. Inflation in Europe is extremely painful, overwhelmingly driven by the rapid increase in price of energy for European consumers, at least in some countries. Most international organisations have downgraded their estimates for European growth. Although most are still forecasting that overall the Eurozone will grow over the course of 2022 and probably 2023 as well, although there is a possibility of a 2023 recession. And that's perhaps understandable given the myriad challenges involved. It's not just the Ukraine war. It's not just supply disruptions out of China. It's also things as wide and diverse as rivers drying up in Germany, preventing shipments from making it around, making the logistical situation even worse. It's a number of factors compounding together in order to create an economic challenge. But there are occasional silver linings. German exports, for example, are up significantly, which is helping to an extent mask the extra money that the state and companies are spending buying energy imports into the country. But the two elements that really differentiate the European economic experience from the one that Russia now faces is firstly that Europe is still largely connected to the global economy. It can still import, it can still export, it can still borrow, it can still invest, and in turn can be invested in. The second element, of course, is that it just has much, much deeper pockets. And when it comes to fighting a war, deep pockets help especially when your continent is facing a determined and sudden energy squeeze. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the energy war. Because while the kinetic aspect of the Ukraine war, and by far the more tragic, difficult and significant part of this conflict is taking place on the territory of Ukraine, in combat between the Ukrainian armed forces and territorial defence and the Russian Federation, a large part of the economic struggle is taking place in Europe, between Russia and the European Union, in the form of the energy crisis. Before February 2022, the European Union as a whole was extremely dependent on the constant imports of Russian energy. That meant gas, that meant oil, and that meant coal. And this dependency was in some cases a deliberate political and economic choice. For years, Russian gas was by far the cheapest option so far as getting energy imports and gave the nations that consumed it in some cases a significant competitive advantage. German industry was in one part so competitive in the export market because of the relatively low cost of energy resources coming out of Russia. Europe was buying about 46% of its gas imports from Russia, as well as a lower percentage of its oil and coal imports. And many did note in advance that this meant that in a crisis, Russia would enjoy tremendous leverage over certain European nations and the EU as a whole. That level of dependency gave Russia the power to suddenly throw the continent into an energy crisis. But it wasn't all one way. Some nations were prepared differently and have different reliance in terms of export sources, and there were also some countries that prepared for potential disruption. Some nations built regasification plants, LNG import terminals, add reverse flow to their pipelines, and added connectors between various points of energy importing infrastructure so they could more freely share energy between themselves in the event of a crisis. It certainly wasn't enough to remove dependency on Russia, not by any stretch but it did provide a small cushion for some countries in the event that a crisis broke out. This immense European dependence on Russian energy goes some way towards explaining why Europe was originally very nervous about getting involved in the energy sanctions business. America fired relatively quickly, Joe Biden announcing that America would just cease importing Russian oil and gas. But that's a comparatively easy decision to make when your country is a major oil and gas producer. By contrast, early European sanctions packages were very forward-looking, very, very soft or silent on the issues of energy and instead focused on financial sanctions, sanctioning Russian individuals, and import restrictions into Russia to weaken Russian industry, as opposed to targeting the oil and gas sector directly. It's this early hesitancy, I think, which gave rise to the idea that perhaps Europe was holding fire on supporting Ukraine with as many weapons as it could in the hopes that Russia would maintain energy supplies. There was a feeling pushed in some media sources that Europe was walking a tightrope, that it wasn't willing to risk enduring a complete energy shutdown, and as a result was modulating the support that it provided for Ukraine. My read, and this is just my read, is that there was certainly some caution going on in Europe in terms of escalation and support for Ukraine, not least because of the fact that the EU operates on a consensus basis, 
and there were at least some actors inside the European tent who were not exactly keen to sanction Russia at all. But a slow start didn't rule out eventual escalation, with Ukraine managing to fight off the initial Russian offensive and it clear that the war would progress, Europe did indeed find its courage on more stern sanctions. Package 6 in the May-June period is probably the marker of when things really started to change. By this point, Europe is throttling technology inputs into the Russian energy sector and has announced an intention to wean itself off Russian gas and to cease oil imports by tanker, which is about two-thirds of European oil imports, by the end of 2022. Europe was essentially announcing an intention to wean itself slowly off Russian energy to transition at an incredible pace in late 2022 and through 2023. And in response, Russia appears to have looked at this and decided to get ahead of the European sanctions by starting to throttle supply more aggressively than the Europeans themselves were intending to do. You can certainly see the logic of that move on the Russian part. If the Europeans have said they can endure a certain speed of transition away from Russian energy and you want to put pressure on them, then clearly the answer is to dial down supply far quicker than the Europeans have said they're comfortable with. Thus began the energy squeeze and the spike in prices in the May-June period. Once the Russians started throttling energy supplies, the changes started happening really, really quickly. Supplies were cut off entirely to certain countries like Poland, Nord Stream 1 was reduced to 20% of its normal capacity and endured substantial and continuous shutdowns. The combination of a rapid reduction in supply coupled with European nations trying to fill their storage tanks ahead of winter meant that the price for gas skyrocketed. Exactly how much depends on where you put your start point, but it's anywhere between two and four times as an increase by the time it got to its spike. In some ways, I believe that the impact of this change was actually magnified by the fact that during COVID lockdowns, the continent had gotten used to exceptionally cheap gas imports. The price of oil and gas had gone through the floor during the global economic slowdown. So even if the Russian intervention had only doubled prices relative to a more normal or more realistic baseline, the continent had gotten used to some very, very cheap energy. The challenge was now clearly set out and the economic damage was being done. Russia was making windfall revenues while Europe was importing lower quantities of gas for its trouble. But I've talked before about how actors don't stay static, and faced with this challenge from Russia, European governments did not stand still. Nor did they go crawling back to Russia asking for the gas to be turned back on. In some ways, I think the European response to the energy crisis probably deserves a video of its own. It was a mammoth diplomatic, economic and technical undertaking that is still going to this day. Having between a third and a half of your energy imports suddenly throttled is incredibly traumatic for industrialised nations, and the adaptation that has gone into dealing with the problem has been gargantuan. If there is a goal to the shutdown of Russian energy supplies to Europe, I think it is safe to say that it is political rather than economic in nature. The goal is not to make as much money as possible. The goal is to convince European nations to give up on the idea of sanctioning Russia and defending Ukraine. It's economic coercion. It's aimed at achieving a change in European policy, a surrender, if you will. And faced with the opportunity to sell out their principles in exchange for turning Russian gas back on, well, the Europeans basically chose to do everything else. In Germany, members of the Greens Party signed off on returning old polluting coal-fired power stations to production. Across Europe, coal mines that were in shutdown or diminished production accelerated their efforts, and from places as far afield as Australia and Indonesia, coal exports that were barred from the People's Republic of China were diverted to help get European energy generation running again. Crash programs were initiated to increase the amount of LNG import capacity so that more liquefied gas could be brought in from places like Qatar and the United States. And a combination of aggressive rationing and a determination to fill up storage tanks was implemented to make sure that no matter what Russia did with energy imports in the future, the continent would be able to make it through the winter. Above all, the continent did the thing that developed nations are able to do during many crises. They pulled out their credit card and started outbidding the global market. If there was gas out there or coal out there, Europe was going to buy it, even if it had to do it at a 50, 100 or 150% premium. It was going to get the energy. And through a combination of all of these measures, reactivating old infrastructure, cutting demand, agreeing rationing, pulling out the pocketbook, finding new export partners and expanding infrastructure, Europe hit its target of 80% gas storage capacity filled two months ahead of schedule. 
And all the while, the Alliance did the one thing the Russians couldn't afford them to do. They largely stuck together. You see, some nations were going to suffer from gas shortages far more than others. And in order to mitigate and navigate the crisis, countries would need to be willing to share resources and share pain, even when their own people were hurting. So when Poland was cut off for gas supplies, other countries in Europe that were also seeing their own supplies threatened would have to agree to use their infrastructure in order to keep the Polish economy going. Largely, they did. And it's been that kind of act of unity, coupled with all of the emergency measures around buying in new gas, activating infrastructure, etc., that has enabled Europe to get to this point, where it is in immense economic pain because of the sky-high price of electricity and energy, but its storages are nearing full, and it's gaining the capacity to get through winter one way or the other. And I wanted to give a sample of some of these adaptations because Europe seems to be announcing new measures almost every week. France, for example, has announced that they plan to bring 32 currently offline nuclear reactors online by winter, which will be a mammoth servicing and engineering effort. Germany, as I've already said, has brought the Meyerin coal plant back online. It's big, it's ugly, it's polluting, but half a million German families are going to be able to draw on that thing for power over the course of the winter. There's also an open question over whether or not Germany will extend the lifespan of a number of nuclear reactors, two in particular, which are due to go offline at the end of the year. And I believe the recent stress test of the German power grid has recommended extending the life of two of the three reactors, which are otherwise due to come offline in December. There's been a spate of construction ordering of floating LNG import terminals to increase LNG import capacity, and there have been a range of usage restrictions. Because as Europe has noted, even relatively small reductions in target thermostat values, for example, can result in very, very significant gas savings. And I also want to address a double standard in analytics that I sometimes see with people addressing the Russian and the European economies. There is an understanding that the Russian economy is doing better than expected, in part because the government has been able to directly intervene with increased welfare payments, transfer payments to individuals, support payments for industry, subsidised loans, government stimulus, and other spending initiatives that hold the economy up. All those options are available to the European economies as well. Government debt levels in the primary EU economies are low by global standards and governments have recent COVID experience in holding up industry and populations during a time of crisis. Germany's debt levels, supported by decades of relatively prudent fiscal policy, are well below those of, for example, the United States. So what I'm basically saying is that while it is very clear that winter and next year are going to be very, very painful, don't count out the sheer number of options that are available to the European economies and to European governments to help manage the crisis. Nor should we forget that if Russia does completely cut off gas shipments to Europe, there is no pipeline infrastructure to carry that gas anywhere else, and the Russian government, which is in the midst of a war, is going to have to find a way to make up for that lost revenue. So if that's what's happened to date, inevitably you're going to ask the question of what happens next. Now, at the time of recording, Nord Stream 1 is due to resume service at 20% capacity relatively soon. To be honest, I'm not sure it's going to turn back on, and if it does turn back on, I'm not sure it won't pretty much immediately turn back off again. I think the Russians are basically done supplying Germany and Central European nations with gas through Nord Stream 1. If the goal is maximum economic pressure, then the supply needs to decrease to as close to zero as possible as quickly as possible. At the same time as that likely escalation from Russia, I think Europe is preparing some escalations of its own, pretty radical reforms into the gas mask market and energy pricing. Now, I'm sure the details would test the patience even of listeners to this channel, because it is basically a bunch of administrative mumbo jumbo, but reforming the pricing scheme, decoupling the price of electricity from the price of gas, changing the mechanisms wherein price for the entire market is set by the highest cost operator that is required to service electricity. These sorts of intense market reforms, even price caps on imported Russian energy, these interventions which would have been unthinkable are now on the cards in order to try and bring energy prices down. And it's an expectation of those sort of interventions taking place that helps explain why the prices are starting to come down a bit. So far as winter goes, Europe now has enough gas and energy resources in storage that it can basically keep the lights on through winter, even if Russia cuts off supplies tomorrow. Europe is not looking at a pleasant winter. It's looking at a pretty hard winter. It's going to be colder inside. No one's going to be heating their pools. Industry is going to be required to slow, not stop, but to slow. And gas consumption across the continent is going to have to come down compared to historical standards. Energy prices are going to have to go up and assistance from government, particularly to vulnerable households, is going to have to go up in order to avoid social suffering. But the Russian threats of people freezing to death in Europe are basically not going to come through. 
and frankly, they never were. Europe has too much storage capacity, too many alternate input partners, and at the end of the day, Europe has too much market power and too much cash to be left freezing to death. This winter is undoubtedly going to be the hardest. The winter of 2023, depending on the situation by then, is likely also to be very, very hard. But by 2024, the impact of Russia on the European energy market should be basically at a low ebb. This is obviously a much faster transition away from Russian energy than Europe was planning on making. But when the guy that you're importing from starts invading countries and you start sanctioning them, well, they're suddenly not a very reliable import partner and you've got to make hard choices pretty damn quickly. To all my friends in Europe, I know it's going to be a bit of a cold winter, but I know you'll all make it. And while Europe prepares for a winter without Russian gas, the continent also sets its sights on the Russian oil market. Europe is the destination for more than half of Russian oil exports, and the sixth round of sanctions, which should come into effect by the end of the year, basically ban at least 75% of this. The sanctions prohibit tanker oil, which is about three quarters of oil imports, from entering Europe. And while it does carve out an exception for oil that's brought in by pipeline, some countries that bring in Russian oil by pipeline, namely Poland, have basically said they're going to stop importing it anyway. Because it's Poland and the other guy is Russia, like what do you expect? And those sanctions are expected to be combined with a whole range of measures intended to target Russian oil revenues. There's going to be the ban on tanker oil, as I've discussed. There's also the potential resumption of the Iranian nuclear deal, which would put a lot of Iranian oil back on the market and help bring the global price of oil down. There's also a talk of prohibiting Russian oil, getting things like maritime insurance, imposing price caps on Russian oil carried by European-controlled or European-flagged ships, pressure on other production sources in order to adopt a price cap on Russian oil, and there are factors beyond anyone's control, like the fact that India, which has been buying a lot more Russian oil, just doesn't physically have much room for the stuff in their storage tanks. Oil is a really important one to look at going forward. Oil is more important for Russian revenues than gas is in raw revenue terms. And so the main effort that Russia has been trumpeting is that they will simply repoint all of their oil to other markets, namely India and China. Now, to an extent, that's exactly what has happened. But that's not the entire story. Because China and India aren't really in the business of doing Russia any favours. And when they and others buy Russian oil, they're buying it at an exceptionally steep discount. Historically, the discrepancy between the price of Russian Ural oil and the Brent crude benchmark has never been more than about five bucks a barrel. Countries like India and China are now buying this stuff at $35 a barrel discount, and the amount of discount has actually increased in July compared to April. Now, that was all well and good in June when Brent was trading for $120 a barrel. Russia produces the stuff for about 40 bucks a barrel, so a 30 buck discount on 120 means you're selling it for about 90. So even with the extra shipping costs to get it to Asia, as opposed to just through a pipeline to Europe, means that there's still a decent profit margin there. But oil's trading at $93 a barrel now, and there's reason to believe it may go lower. You see things like global recessions, as well as potentially Iranian oil coming back onto the market, and the US and other producers dialing up supply, well, that all means the price may well go south. And at $93 a barrel, a $35 a barrel discount starts to get pretty significant. At $122 a barrel, assuming a $35 buck discount, a $40 production cost, and let's just say a $5 per barrel shipping cost to get it to Asia, Russia's making a profit of about $42 a barrel. At $92 a barrel and those same reductions, the profit shrinks to $12 bucks a barrel. The price has only gone down by a quarter, but the profit has gone down by 75%. If your prices fall to December 2021 range, then Russia may as well cap its wells because it ain't making any money. And so this is the interesting flip side. Russia is trying to control Europe by cutting off gas supplies, and Europe and the United States are trying to retaliate by bringing down the international oil price, while also using sanctions to keep that $35 a barrel discount in place for Russian oil. If you can destroy Russian profitability on oil sales, the entire Russian federal budget gets undermined incredibly quickly. So if you're wondering why the US and other countries are ramping up oil production, this might have something to do with it. The Russians are playing the gas game, and the West is playing the oil game. Of course, if the oil price goes up, then Russia's ability to sustain the conflict goes up with it. I'm not predicting the oil market here, I'm just explaining which direction each side is trying to push it. But that's enough about prices, let's bring this back to the fundamentals of what each side is trying to achieve, because the energy war has different objectives for each side. For Ukraine's Western allies, the goal is to break down Russia's ability to afford to carry on the war. 
to run down Russia's foreign exchange, to increase the domestic price of the war, to make it more difficult to sustain. For Russia, by contrast, it's not about destroying the Western economies. That's obviously beyond their capabilities. It's about breaking up the unity of the European Union and encouraging them to force concessions on the Ukrainian issue. The idea basically is to get European nations to tell Zelensky to cut a deal, to stop providing financial and military to support to Ukraine, and to put pressure on the United States to do the same so that Ukraine will be forced to sue for peace. And while it's possible that works, I don't think it will, because it rests on a series of assumptions that I don't think are particularly safe. The first is the assumption that Russia is capable of doing massive damage to European economies by turning off energy supplies. Certainly it's capable of inflicting pain, but whether or not it's enough pain that people believe that it's necessary to sell out Ukraine for, I think that's another question. And it's really linked to this second assumption, which is Europe would rather turn the energy back on and surrender to Russia as opposed to do literally anything else pull out the pocketbook and pay more for gas from elsewhere, implement new infrastructure, implement energy rationing, or increase their own domestic production. It also assumes that Europe would even trust Russia as an energy supplier if it came to the table and struck a deal. After this current experience, do you think there are any European leaders who will believe that Russia will keep its word on energy supplies in the future? Wouldn't they be concerned that the next time a European government did something the Kremlin didn't approve of, off goes the energy again and they're back to square one? It seems to me that there's been a political sea change in Europe and most countries understand that one way or another, if you're going to be sovereign, you have to transition away from a dependence on Russian energy imports. Because if they don't trust you, they're going to make other hard choices instead. Europe is going to ration energy and shut down some industry. It's going to pay more for its energy. It's going to turn on its old cold fire plants or it's going to extend the lifespan of its nuclear plants. Global warming transition policy be damned for a year or two. Anything to avoid conceding to Russia. In extremists, Europe even has other options. The Groningen field in the Netherlands. Extraction there is down on historical standards and was due to stop because extracting gas from that field is associated with localised earthquakes that have caused damage to the homes of tens of thousands of people. But if it's a choice between Europe going dark or conceding to Russia or risking localised earthquakes, there's a chance that Europe makes the call to pump the gas anyway. It's an example of a hard choice that a country or a continent can make that provides an alternative, no matter how unpalatable, to conceding to Russia in order to get the gas flowing through Nord Stream 1 again. But even if all that took place, even if you damage the European economy and the Europeans trust you enough and the Germans, for example, decide they want the gas turned back on and they're willing to pressure Zelensky in order to do it, how on earth does that lead to an end of the conflict unless you also get the United States and countries like Poland on board? Because European support is helpful, but ultimately, at the end of the day, most of the weapons are coming from places like the United States, the United Kingdom, and Poland, and these are not countries that are being directly impacted by shutdowns in, say, Nord Stream 1 shipments. So frankly, I'm not sure this will work. And there's one more problem too. Russia's running out of screws to turn. Because unfortunately for Russia, the pipes don't run in reverse. Once it gets to the point where it's shipping zero energy to Europe, its leverage is over. It can't take back the energy it has historically provided. It can't vacuum up gas out of German storages. Once it's no longer exporting energy, its leverage is done. Its leverage is gone. So if Europe is able to complete its transition, albeit on an emergency basis, then the coercion is suddenly no longer effective. So really, I think the question is a political one. Will European political will or Western political will break before Europe is able to complete a transition away from Russian energy? Which brings us to what I think is perhaps the most important part of this six-month update. What is the political dimension looking like and what is the will of the various parties to carry on the conflict? Let's be clear, it's been a weird kind of war. Probably one of the first true social media conflicts that we've seen. And like most prototypes, it's just a bit strange all around. The defense minister of Ukraine, Alexei Reznikov, his avatar is currently a dog character, a Shiba Inu dog character holding a high Mars uh, with a picture of a bridge exploding in the background. Russian state TV and telegram channels feature content from Chechen TikTok warriors and news anchors explaining their intention to invade Poland after they're done with Ukraine. And if you want up-to-date information on how the war is going, you don't always check the news, you jump on Telegram, and if you want to know what's happening in the Kherson Oblast, 
Well, then one of the best sources for up-to-date video and information on HIMARS strikes is a channel called Special Curse on Cat with the handle Bayraktar underscore one love. Like I said, it's a strange war. But just because it's weird doesn't mean it's not incredibly important. The social media side of things, the propaganda side of things, the impact on public opinion, public confidence is incredibly integral to the way this conflict will go. So it's worth looking at what the political opinion in the European Union, in the US, in Ukraine is, because ultimately Russia's win condition is to break the will of its opponents to resist and bring them to the table. It needs Ukraine to be willing to negotiate and it needs Ukraine's Western partners to push it to do so, because as long as Ukraine has constant infusions of aid from the West, it's going to have the capacity and thus probably the will to continue fighting. That's where the Telegram and the TikTok and the state media channels come in on one side, and where the, the cartoon dogs and the memes come in on the other. It's about the battle for public opinion. And while I think people sometimes overstate Russian military failures in Ukraine, I think they understate the colossal failure of Russian political and communication strategy in Europe. Because to be clear, breaking up the cohesion of the European Union is a clear strategic goal for Russia. Weakening the EU and weakening NATO is essentially a long-term win condition because it allows Russia to build its own influence over areas that it considers it's near abroad. And so what you'd be looking for Russia to try and do is to break up the unity of the European Union and the coalition of Western nations. From that perspective, the war has been an unmitigated disaster. You can't pretend that there is complete unity in the European Union. It's bloody Europe. Like, it's not going to be fully united. This is a bloc which brings together, like, Sweden and Hungary. You're never going to have uniformity of opinions on all issues. And it's also always going to be fashionable in many countries to blame Brussels for everything that's happening. After all, it's always easy to say that the bureaucrats over in Brussels don't care about you and that the government should be focusing more on the people of insert country here. That's a very easy populist appeal. And the hope may well have been that faced with an energy crisis, countries in Europe would abandon the European ideal and focus on looking out for number one. Let me show you some survey data on how that particular effort's going. When surveyed... The number of Europeans who said that they believed that their country's membership of the European Union was a good thing reached its highest ever level in the April-May surveys of 2022. 65% said unambiguously that they thought European Union membership for their country was a good thing. 26% said, you know, it was sort of neutral, and only 8% thought the EU was a bad idea for their country. You go back a decade and the number of people thinking it was a bad idea was about twice as high. So according to this indicator, at least, the war seems to have actually pushed support for European Union membership up. And I think this is even more interesting when you look at it at a nation by nation level. What you've got in front of you is a graph which compares the percentage of respondents in given countries who believe that their membership of the European Union is extremely important for their country. So 7, 8, 9 or 10 out of 10 level of importance. Grey bar is November, December 2021. Blue bar is April, May 2022. And what you see across the board, almost, with one exception, is a massive increase in the number of people who think that their membership of the European Union is very important. It probably will surprise absolutely no one to see that Lithuania had one of the biggest jumps, but it does warm my heart a little bit to see good old Trvatska move above the 50% mark to 58%. And in terms of the health of the overall bloc, seeing those increases in Italy and France is probably also something that will give Brussels some encouragement. So far, so good for Vladimir Putin's charm offensive. And given those previous results, it's probably also not surprising to hear that European citizens' positive image of the EU is again at its highest level on record. 52% positive, 36% neutral, and 12% negative. Again, it seems to be that in times of crisis, Europeans are actually more likely to band together as opposed to break up and declare every man and woman for themselves. But of course, Moscow doesn't just care about European cohesion. European cohesion is bad for Moscow, to be sure, but it's mostly concerned with European determination for staying the course and supporting Ukraine. So perhaps the numbers there, I don't know, maybe the numbers there are better for Moscow. Yeah, nah, the numbers there are pretty trash for Russia, to be honest. Of those surveyed in the European Union, there's majority support for basically all sorts of support for Ukraine continuing. 70% support for military aid, 80% for more financial support, 90 plus percent for more humanitarian aid and taking in refugees. 
a majority of people surveyed say it is more important to defend democracy than price stability. Although I will call out four honourable mentions, which is countries where more people said it was important to protect prices than democracy. Honourable mentions to Hungary, Bulgaria, Malta and Romania. Good job, guys. I never want to be accused of cherry-picking data, so I'm going to call out things like that when they appear. There's also majority support in the EU among those surveyed for bringing Ukraine into the European Union itself, although only when you add the qualifier that Ukraine will enter when it's ready, which I take to mean assuming that the war is over and that Ukraine has met the usual entry requirements. And the flip side to this willingness to support Ukraine, because let's be honest, 70%, 80%, 90% support in an electorate for any given action is insane. In an era of political polarisation across the world, getting two-thirds, three-quarters, 90% of a population to support any course of action makes it a no-brainer for a government and perhaps goes some way to explaining why many governments are facing criticisms from their own people for not dialing the support up enough. But the flip side to this is that opinions of Russia have absolutely grated. And this is important because sympathy for Russia and favourable views of Russia are important if you want European nations to push a peace deal which is favourable to Russia or to consider resuming Russian energy dependency. So I've got a graph on the bottom right there that I'll blow up in detail on the next screen showing the change in opinion of Russia between 2020 and 2022. So here the biggest falls have actually been in countries like Italy and Greece. In 2020, Italy had 48% of the population holding a positive view of Russia. Greece, 58% of the population had a positive view in 2019. Well, now the numbers are 14% and 27% respectively in Italy and Greece. That is a 34 and 31 percentage point crash respectively. But I think the real prize here has to go to Poland at third. They've managed a 31 percentage point decrease, the same as Greece. The only difference is Poland started with a 33% positive view of Russia, which means that now Poland's positive opinion of Russia is 2. Not 20, 2. And given Poland, I wouldn't be half surprised if that 2% actually came when the surveyors accidentally rang the Russian embassy. But jokes aside, the numbers across the board inside and out of Europe are dire. 13% in Korea, 19% in Israel, 9% in France, down from 31. UK, 24 down to 10, not as huge an increase. Germany from 30 down to 16. Sweden from 16 to 5. Which puts the Swedes in roughly the same category as the Poles. The problem for Russia that I foresee is it's very hard for governments to flip on Ukraine and agree to concessions with Russia with this sort of public opinion going on. When you have a strong public majority in support of Ukraine and ongoing financial and military assistance and very, very, very low positive opinions of the Kremlin, it's hard for a government, even if it wants to, to agree to make concessions to Russia or to pressure Zelensky to give in. And it may even be the case, this is just supposition, it may even be the case that the attempts at energy-driven coercion has in fact just hardened European opinions against Russia as opposed to convince the public that they should concede. Although, of course, there will always be variations by country, by demography. But hey, uh, the Europeans aren't the primary suppliers of military aid to Ukraine. Unless you count tanks, Poland is still very clearly in the lead there. The most important single supplier is obviously the United States. So maybe opinion in the US is changing. And the answer is American opinion on Ukraine has changed. It's actually become slightly more pro-Ukraine over the last month. Overall, it's hard right now to get a majority of Americans to agree on anything. Americans, I try not to comment on your politics, but as an outside observer, your level of political polarization is frankly insane. But when surveyed, something like 54% of Americans agreed that there should be open-ended support for Ukraine as long as it wishes to continue fighting to defend itself against Russia. 24% said not sure, so the percentage who say that they are against open-ended support is only about 22%. Now, I will add a caveat here from looking at all these different surveys. If you see a pro-Russian source arguing that the numbers are perhaps a little bit opposite to that and that a majority of Americans are actually dissatisfied, look very closely at the question. And this comes back to the way American politics is currently structured. If you ask Americans whether or not they agree with Joe Biden's package of support for Ukraine, then you're going to get a much lower level of positive opinion. But if you ask Americans whether or not they support Ukraine and giving Ukraine money and weapons and support against Russia for as long as they need it, the number goes up. But attaching Joe Biden's name to it 
introduces a party affiliation, which brings the numbers down. So just watch the specific question that was being asked whenever a survey is being cited. But when you take the politics out of it, there are more Republicans in support of open-ended support for Ukraine than are against it by a significant margin. Most Americans say they're willing to pay more for gas and basics and staples in order to support Ukraine. A majority do want more oversight over the funding that is being provided to Ukraine, which is why America has sent a brigadier general to Kyiv to help monitor and provide additional oversight. And most Americans want it to be senior State Department officials and military officers who are deciding what aid gets sent and how it gets carried out, as opposed to political appointees in the Biden administration. Again, that comes down to political party affiliation in the US, I think. But overall, even with less attention being paid to the conflict and a midterm election on the horizon, survey data seems to suggest that this is one of the few issues where Americans generally agree. They want more support to go to Ukraine. And in fact, there are some areas where Americans are much more hawkish than their government or indeed any of the allied governments. American popular support, according to some uh, a University of Maryland survey, shows that American public support for a no-fly zone over Ukraine, wherein allied forces would start shooting down Russian cruise missiles and aircraft, is actually up over time. In March, it was 54%. Now it's apparently 65%. So while there is a strong majority of Americans against boots on the ground in Ukraine, there's apparently majority public support for shooting down Russian aircraft over Ukraine and clearing the skies. Now, as an outsider, I can only guess as to the explanation for that statistic. Perhaps it is as simple as Americans don't like putting their soldiers in harm's way, but they're pretty confident in the ability of the USAF to go in and sort out business. Nuclear brinksmanship be damned, it's apparently time to shoot down some Ruskies, at least according to the American public. So there you go. If the current US government was replaced by an avatar representing the collective will of the American people, then those F-22 Raptors that are now being based in Europe would be flying combat missions and clearing the skies of Russian aircraft and cruise missiles relatively soon. Maybe they just want Top Gun 3 to include more real-world footage. Who knows? Although someone should tell them that BVR engagement footage isn't exactly riveting to watch. So we've established that for the moment at least, it seems like public support in the Western camp is strongly in favour of ongoing and continuous support to Ukraine. Whatever the news headlines might be, whenever you actually poll members of the public, the support seems to be there. And so the question of where this war is going over the next 1, 2, 3, 6, 12 months comes back to where the Ukrainians themselves stand and how willing they are to carry on the fight. Because the sanctions against Russia will only bite over time which means the Ukrainians themselves need to be willing to put up a long and sustained fight. And so far, at least, I don't think they've given analysts any reason to doubt that they are willing to stay the course. And let's be clear here. Ukrainians, individuals, and as groups will absolutely complain about individual measures and individual costs. Troops will gripe because troops in all armies gripe. Members of the public will get annoyed or be complaining when there are particularly harsh economic measures or when the government makes errors because the government will make errors. But at the big picture level, at the zoomed out level, Ukrainians continue to volunteer for service in the army. They continue to sell their possessions in order to donate to the armed forces. They agitate at home and internationally for continuing the fight. They volunteer their labor and their services, even if they are not in uniform, again, to support the actions of the armed forces. When you look at opinion polls, both internal and external, and I've looked at several, the approval rating of the way Zelensky is handling the war remains in the stratosphere. The approval rating of the armed forces themselves is at something like 95 plus percent over all surveyed. Now, just to prove some things don't change no matter what country you're in, the approval rating for the Ukrainian parliament, the RADA, it's actually pretty low. <laughs> Um, but approval of the Ministry of Defence for the Office of the President and for the Armed Forces is very, very high. But more important than approval ratings, and more problematic from the Russian perspective, I think, is the fact that Ukrainians, even after six months of hard fighting and of having some of their territory taken and casualties piling up, well, they're still optimistic. Overall, a vast, vast majority of Ukrainians believe that their country is definitely or likely going to win the war. Only like 2% of Ukrainians think it is likely or definite that their country will in fact lose. You've got the results of one survey by region presented there in the slide. And one thing that stands out to me is the opinions of those in the east of the country. This is dominated by the Kharkiv Oblast, 
a city which is constantly being shelled day in and day out. That, in terms of demographics, dominates what this survey defined as the eastern region. Now, while opinions in that region are lower than in the west or the centre or the south, what you still have is 94% of survey respondents saying that in the end they think they're going to win. And the reason that's a problem for Russia is that it's very hard to convince people to surrender if they think they're going to win. And you can see that reflected in what Ukrainians say they would be willing to do in order to achieve a negotiated peace. 40% of Ukrainians say they'd be willing to make no concessions whatsoever in order to achieve peace. They want all their territory back and they want Russia to go home and that's the end of the story and they will keep fighting until they get to that point. 29% of Ukrainians say they're willing to agree not to join NATO and accept some sort of neutral status. But it's notable that that number is actually a decrease since the war began. 5% are willing to recognise the loss of Crimea. 2% are willing to recognise the so-called LNR and DPR as independent states. And 5% say that they will make those concessions and they'll recognise Russian as a state language. But that's about as far as they will go. None of the options put forward involve giving up any more territory than Russia controlled at February 24th, 2022. So if the goal of the Russian campaign is to break the will of Ukrainians to continue fighting, then as far as the best statistics I can find from inside and outside Ukraine go, their mission is going terribly. I know that there are people within Ukraine who are pro-Russia or who are anti-war. Some of them have contacted me. They exist. There is diversity of opinion in every country. And 5% of the population in the East thinking that Ukraine may lose, that's still a significant body of people. But it is absolutely dwarfed by the incredible unity we are seeing around the idea that Ukraine can eventually win. Now, all of this can change. Hard winters, growing casualties, ongoing fighting, war fatigue may set in, the opinions of Ukrainians may change. But so may the opinions of Russians. And the point here is that the starting point, the current data, suggests that there is a huge way for Ukrainian public opinion to go before Russia can get anything like the peace that it seems to be suggesting that it wants. Because even the offer in which Ukraine declares neutrality according to Ukrainian public support, if you look at that 29%, that still involves Russia giving back Crimea and Ukraine taking back Donetsk and Luhansk, which is something I don't think Moscow is anywhere near willing to accept. And so the fighting will go on. Ukraine is not just unwilling to surrender, political accommodation with Russia is politically toxic and indeed impossible for Ukraine's leaders under current circumstances. At the same time, public opinion in the supporting nations, Western Europe, NATO allies, the United States, is still very, very high with a majority of public support in favour of supporting Ukraine and a lot of people having a very, very, very negative opinion of the Russian Federation. As long as that support remains there in economic terms, Ukraine's ability to continue the fight will continue. Russia's will to carry on the war is a different question and one I'm probably going to have to tackle another time. It's hard to get reliable public opinion data from Ukraine, and the analysis around how you try and calculate it probably deserves its own feature. For now, let's settle on the fact that the Russian government is unwilling to concede, and the Ukrainian public and the Western public are certainly unwilling to concede. That leaves only one option. Both sides will continue to duke it out on the battlefield in order to change the other person's mind or to change the reality on the battlefield. In that area, it's not about gas supplies and economics so much as shell supplies, manpower, and battlefield performance. It's an entirely different aspect of this conflict. And I will do a six-month update on it, or probably a seven-month update on it by the time I get to it. But for now, this has been a pretty long one, so let's close out. In conclusion, six months on, there is no sign that either side is going to be able to achieve a quick, decisive win on the battlefield, which means victory in Ukraine is going to be decided by having either Russia break the will of Ukraine and its allies to resist, or Ukraine and its allies wear down Russia's will to continue. From a statistical perspective, Ukrainian will is intact and the battlefield outcomes are indecisive. Russia has deployed close to the maximum level of energy coercion it can manage against the Western allies, and for the moment at least, while Europe is hurting, the coalition seems to be holding together. The European and American economies are certainly wounded, but they remain much, much more hefty and healthier than the Russian economy is by contrast. 
2023 is likely to be a bit of an inflection point for the energy war, as the gas squeeze on Europe continues but adaptation continues, while the Europeans and the Americans go on hardcore offence against global oil prices in an attempt to undermine Russian oil revenues. The question in the short term, with will persisting and the economy still mostly intact, is what will happen on the battlefield in the second half of 2022 and the first half of 2023. If there is appetite for that topic, I will cover it. Otherwise, I will leave it here with a study of the economics and the politics behind this war. I'm still not going to come out and make a judgment on who is winning on the battlefield. All I am saying is that if Russia's goal was to convince Kyiv to come to the negotiating table and cede territory in exchange for peace, well, they've got a really long way to go yet. All right, channel update to close out. This week's video was originally going to be a study of the current status of the Ukrainian battlefield and weapon resupply efforts. What I've decided, though, is because the curse on front is so active at the moment, that update really should hold off for a couple of weeks until we have more information and I can make a more complete episode on the topic. Instead, I thought I would cover an update on the economics and the politics, because ultimately they are as decisive and probably much less covered than movements on the battlefield. In terms of channel updates themselves, subtitling is going very, very well. One of my volunteers in particular is churning them out, and I've got a couple other people online as well, so that is now progressing well. My goal is eventually to get ahead of schedule in terms of production so I can provide videos to subtitlers in advance, so the closed captions are available when the videos go up instead, but that'll require me to put some effort into really producing ahead of schedule. In any case, that leaves me with a couple of things to do this week. The first is I will start reaching out to the many people who volunteered to do translation work. There are now videos with English subtitles that are eligible for translation, so I'll follow people up on that point. The second is I did say if the Patreon ever hit a thousand people, I would look seriously at the Discord question. Some people experienced in that area have volunteered and come forward. I'll try and reach out to them this week. I'll also try and clear my patron message backlog. I've received a number of messages from patrons. Don't worry, I will respond to you as soon as I can. And finally, we did have a sponsor come in today. And just as when Ground News first sponsored me, I'd like to give a portion of the proceeds to charity. So patrons, I will be putting up a poll at some point this week with some charities I'm considering, and you guys can pick which one the money goes to. That's all from me. For those of you in Ukraine or in Europe who are living through this, my best wishes as always. Thank you to everyone who is listening in, and I'll see you all next week.